I remember I had a, a friend that lived in the South Bronx, and he used to tell us these crazy cockroach stories, you know, like you turn on the light and they're all around, like crazy stories back in the college days. And I was like, how cool would that to be in a, be in a game? If only and, we could just push him back. With, with <laughs> yeah, <the light>. yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of PlayStation Underground. You got Tim here, and I'm joined by Kristen. Hello. And we're checking out Oddworld Soulstorm. Um, we're joined by two very special guests. We got Benny Terry, executive producer at Oddworld Inhabitants. Thanks for joining us, Benny. Thank you so much for having me. And none other than Lorne Lanning, co-founder and president of Oddworld Inhabitants and creator of the, the Abe IP, the whole Oddworld IP. Uh, Lorne, such an honor to have you with us. Uh, thanks for having us on, Tim. Yeah. Glad to be here. It's a great relief <laughs> to be yeah. talk, talking about the game rather than building the game. Yeah, yeah we're, we're so close um, to right. uh, a- April 6th release on PS4 and PS5. And, and just for those, you know, checking out the game, uh, as a heads up, this was a you know, pre-recorded gameplay. We're checking out new sections of some levels, um, but uh, you'll see us kind of jump from, from area to area. So it's not all exactly the same sequence that we'll see in the final game. But um, Benny, Lauren, can you, can you tell us a little bit? Uh, maybe we'll start with you. Uh, Lauren, what section of the game are we starting out with here? This is uh, where you saw right in the beginning. This is the very beginning of the game. And this is what we call uh, officially what the level is called, Benny. I, you might have to update me because it's changed somewhat as all the, uh, <laughs> as you know, from from uh, working titles of levels yeah. to what the I actual one love, is. I always love the internal code names. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, so th- this is the mosaic and this is where the game begins. And uh, right out of the opening movie. And we wanted to start this game off with more action, like yeah. more defensive play. Uh, so there's almost no offensive play. You're just trying to survive and, and stay trying out of trouble out of and there. not get oh, wrecked. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And we really wanted to uh, have this sense that in the background is all of the characters that are trying to meet you at a safe place, mm-hmm. um, you know, after this this trek. Oh, okay, yeah, you can yeah. really see that line in the background of them all running. Yeah, so you'll see them at different times, and they're sort of fleeing. Uh, and the opening movie uh, sort of gives this a lot more context. But one of the new mechanics that we really wanted was um, related to the the secret of the game, or I should say the mystery, which is the brew. And the brew is really at the heart of uh, the theme here. And the theme is, you may have saved yourself from an oppressor, but have you, but really have you saved yourself from your own ad- addictions and habits and mm. things that enslave your yeah. mind. Right. And so that's a, sort of a, a generalized theme of Jump where this game takes little. off. And, um, and what they're finding is that what Abe will discover is there's a lot more to the brew than he knows about. But one of its qualities is flammability. And so okay. we, really, we really wanted a sense of a volatile world. And we wanted a, a true, like, something that, you know, you're kind of um, pushing on or, or, or putting out. So fire and flammability of liquid became a thing. Yeah, I was going to say, this level we're seeing a lot of, he's just trying to, you know, douse where he can and, and keep things cool so that he's not running through fire. Yeah, yeah, so at times he's picking up flammability, and at times he's picking up water that puts out flammability. Mm-hmm. So the brew is flammable, and uh, at times you need to burn things down, and at times you put them out. But then it has a lot of uh, trap conditions where you can, you know, lay brew pits and then it will you see how the flames spread yeah oh, wow. so you, you can spread fire uh quite well you know in a in a liquid sense and this is just something historically in games i always wanted to have this sense of a fire that actually burned and could spread and and was was not just a canned effect that kept on repeating itself but had more life to it yeah and uh and that's what you're seeing here and it also burns structures some of these are loaded oh, laden yeah. with explosives and stuff. But these were all things to make the environment a bit more um, volatile itself and that it was changing over time. Hmm. And we've just run through this uh, mosaic area. Oh, yeah. I love that, Get that a little Abe, yeah, so, Kong so inspired moment there. Benny, what would you say beyond uh, like the, the brewing aspect and sort of thinking through, you know, working through fire, working through water, what are some of the other like core features that, that folks can look forward to in Odd Worlds of Storm? Definitely there's an evolution in the way that Abe traverses the world. So from, uh, you know, historical, uh, it was very precise in the way Abe would walk, run, jump, 
hoist, but now he's far more agile, right? Way more flexible in the way that he can move from platform to platform. And what we say internally often is he kind of has a parkouring mobility in his yeah. locomotion. And so you'll see that as as play continues where he's faster, more agile, um, and it just feels more natural to play as Abe, right? Versus the very pixel perfect logic that we had previously. And part of that, uh, driving on part of that was, was that, you know, we've always had sort of notoriously hard games and we didn't want to, and that's part of, part of something that a demographic of our fan base really likes but we had to find a a, a, a sweeter Mm -hmm. spot for it and so we wanted that more of abe was less perfection in your motion where if you didn't get it exactly right you fail and we wanted more abilities to save yourself through dexterity Ah. so that your sort of acrobatic capability i know i've seen a lot of chat on that you know we put in a double jump um (laughs) but i think when people play it it will give it more context because uh, we, we wanted more success due to skill and more saving yourself due to skill. And mm-hmm. as we were playing those things out with his basic moves, the dexterity, um, I, I would say our previous game, if we were dinged, it was largely on controls that we would have some lag times and things like that. That became very important for us to dress and fix on this title. Yeah. <laughs> So on the, on the camera system, one of the things that was really important to us w- was we always wanted to get more cinematic control. In the original mm. games, we had you know movies taking you into the world because we wanted to see our pull in the distance, our goals in the distance. Yeah. This game right. is doing this much more than any game we've done in the past because we actually built the you know this what we call 2.9 where where the character's running ability is not just flat right it's operating in three dimensions but it still retains the controls of the people that like classic platformers and that makes a big difference on like it makes the the space feel more physical like you're actually moving through it right and and it and it controls the framing really well so you always keep abe the player control and the characters that you're focused on in that frame. So the cinematic elements of it are are great, but also just the gameplay, it blends them both together. It was a real win for us on uh, Soulstorm to be able to kind of get all of that together in one camera. Yeah. Yeah, and it was it was it was it had a lot of difficulties as it affected the audio engine because if you think about, you know, most games you're almost always the same distance away from the character with the camera. Whether right. you're POV, whether you're over the shoulder, um, but in this game, the camp, the care, like look at the distance. You know, Abe yeah. just became almost half the size. It, the, the thing I didn't see coming was the impacts on audio that that would be. What are you supposed to hear? Where is the the listening mics in the world for the player? Mm. And it caused us to get into a whole lot of uh, hybrid sort of solutions that we really weren't faced with in the past on previous redu- productions. So just that ability of moving the camera in and out, having the characters traverse uh, three-dimensionally in the world, yeah. um, and <laughs> taking advantage of the higher resolution, like what the PS5 is offering, Instead of going close and getting more detail, which we do at times, but we really wanted that ability where Abe could be really small in the world. And you'll see this at times, and it'll get smaller to make the world feel bigger and more ominous and more real. And that was always. It does feel very, like, vast. He's just. Yeah, and I I, I think it's. It's also cool because, Lauren, I've heard you describe the role of the player in the world of Abe and Oddworld as sort of being like a guardian angel type, too. So I feel like it, you know, helps you zoom out um, and have a a more uh, omnipotent view. There you go. And thank you for that, because uh, (laughs) it it was really important for us. And we wanted that feeling. We never wanted to lose that feeling of the guardian angel. And so, you know, it's tricky, right? As you're approaching the narrative of game, is it the gamer's perspective as the character or are you helping the character? We always looked at it as though you're helping the character. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so making the world feel bigger, have more camera angles on it, uh, feel more cinematic at times. Here he's laying a trap. Abe's laying a trap (laughs) out of a crafted mine, a stun mine that he did, that he crafted, which gives him more agency, gives him a lot more reasons to, uh, you know... (laughs) explore which is another thing we wanted we wanted to make exploration a much more gratifying experience where you just got more wow moments of beauty will he make you know? it through these lasers that's yeah good luck abe <laughs> yeah snipers Ow. Oh. it didn't work out well 
And here we're into the cinematics. So that's the sleek yeah. pilot, and this is Mullock the Glucken. And there's Abe. He just, we're, you know, we're moving ahead in time. He's in process of hijacking a train. But if you notice our characters, again, <laughs> the Gluckin, you'll notice the, we went for hyper expression on the Mudokins on the Gluckins. The Sligs is hard to do that with because they have a mask on, right? But if you look at the Gluckin, if you look at their eyes, we are yeah. constantly scaling their eyeballs bigger or smaller, pu dilating their pupils more. Uh, not just paying attention to what a normal muscular structure would do in deformation animating, mm -hmm. you know, where, where uh, you know, you're like, I want to lift the eyebrows more. I wanted to get more of that classic expression out of classic animation, not so much in the squash and stretch of like bouncing and things like that, but in hyper expression of character faces. And definitely Hollywood caliber techniques in delivering that. Yeah, I was going to say the detail here and the movement is, is so good. Yeah, just the body language of the two characters. The, cig the cigar movie. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny because like always the uh, uh, these were early in the production, right? And as you got later, the, the things keep getting better and team gets more familiar and all this stuff. So I think there really is sort of a ramp of uh, some of the animation stuff gets more sophisticated as we go on. Like you can see here with Mullock's face. It's subtle. Yeah. <laughs> you know, oh, but the it, eye, right there. He's <laughs> twitching. Yeah. <laughs> twitching. And, but, the, but the way that we're, we're doing all these little things, like to get those expressions, we're actually scaling the eyes down, which means the eyelids and all these things, which is something that was a little foreign to um, a lot of the animators, but they loved it. Uh, so, you know, I could, I could belabor that explanation, but it was really about the hyper expression. And then we had animators that largely uh, come from. Um, there was a, no, a long list of animators in the credits really handled the, the, did a stellar job. I was going to say, it sounds yeah. like a fantastic team because th that cutscene right there just looked awesome. I we, love it, yeah. You seem to have moved to a blue cave now. Uh, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, so here we're into, this is a trial. So in this game, this is Abe's trial, and he's facing, in, in the original Abe's Exodus, he faced the fleeches. These are the sleeches. Uh -huh, so it's all right. Like, it's like, they're sl slightly different. But what we wanted was we wanted to play off of two things here predominantly. <laughs> One, that we wanted dynamic light to actually have a purpose kind of like a weapon or like a mm. prod. You know, we could move. These characters that he's uh, dealing with are afraid of the light. Oh, I see. So whenever he shines it, they... Yeah, they so you're in a dark area, right? And you have a light, but there's creatures in this area that are afraid of light. So you're, you're, you're in this push and pull. Uh, dealing with these creatures that are all trying to get you in, in mass. Like, they start to get a lot of them on screen. And you use light to try and manipulate them. So, you, you, you know, which is which was always a theme that I wanted to play with. The idea of, like, um, I've had a couple of homes with uh, rat problems, like an under the house or something like that. <laughs> oh, no. And if you've ever dealt with is rats... That, is that the inspiration? <laughs> it, actually, it actually is. You know, it was just terrible. So here we we really wanted to play with the light, where a it would help you slow down and carefully navigate, and then uh, there's a number of traps. Watch out and for stuff environmental are, hazards. Yeah. Yeah. Environmental yeah. hazards. I'm gonna let Benny talk about that in a minute. And then we really wanted that ability to manipulate a character that was afraid of us, afraid of the light, not afraid of us, but afraid of the light. So here you'll start to notice these things start to creep up on him, but with the light he can push them away and they will flee. And so we wanted that behavior like rats or cockroaches, you know. Um, I remember I had a, a, a friend that lived in the South Bronx, and he used to tell us these crazy cockroach stories, you know, like you turn on the light and they're all around. Like crazy stories back in the college days. And I was like, how cool would that to be in, be in a game? If only and, you could just push them back. With <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And so we, uh, we implemented a fair amount of that. But Benny, why don't you go into the hazards and stuff? I was going to say, tell us a little bit as we move to this train section. Tell us about sort of just environmental hazards that Abe is going to have to move through. So, and that's a classic theme for Oddworld and environmental hazards in Soulstorm. We just up, up the ante quite a bit, <laughs> right? So every level kind of has those persistent environmental hazards. So if the sleeches don't get you, if the sligs don't kill you, right? And they're 
equally as lethal and dangerous than the environmental hazards. They're shooting out of walls, they're fa falling from ceilings, there's bludgeon objects, you know, swinging through worlds. So Abe just has a million different ways he can die, right, and his <laughs> followers. And there's some, there's some hilarity to that. You know, it's like <laughs> it, initially... When I first started seeing not only Abe, but the followers die, I was like, oh, that's gruesome. But then I started laughing because they would <laughs> die in funny ways, right? And it wasn't until we, Lauren, when we uh, had them die with Ragdoll, right? When we had them fly out towards the <laughs> screen, as you see with sniper shots, mm -hmm. it just started making people laugh, right? And I was yeah. like, okay, anytime we get a laugh, uh, that's a feature we want to spend more time and effort on. <laughs> so, <laughs> so just added yeah. more wins like that. A lot of conflicted right. emotions because I love these guys. I want them all to survive, but it's also yeah. hilarious. Yeah, when you, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Times it's, it's just devastating how many yeah. of them will, will get whacked in one hit. Just, oh no! <laughs> you know, and we wanted that. <laughs> Another thing you'll notice here is that um, you, the, there's these blue poles, and they look kind of like. Uh, there's two things going on that you're seeing. There's these blue poles, which are actually slig poles. So now slig's out of our tradition now have the ability to go up and to use poles to get to different level mm. areas, different platforms. And that wasn't the case historically. So it made them more dynamic and it made more acreage that you could traverse with an ongoing conflict. And that was really important to us that it wasn't just like, okay, I have this puzzle. Okay, I've solved this puzzle, I move on. Okay, so now, you know, saving guys can be devastating because they don't always get saved. A lot of times they get yeah. whacked. And in this case, you're releasing guys to climb a ladder on mass. And I'm going to let Benny explain this. Oh, man, I, I love these gauntlets. So, you know, in old Odd World or classic Odd World, you'd have onesie, twosie kind of combat. But yeah. now there's just hundreds and hundreds of guys to save and protect. So Abe escorts them through these different kind of traversal puzzles up to the top as he's dealing with the threats and also just making sure that his guys continue climbing up to safety at the very top. Making sure that they're all safe. Yeah, too. yeah if you see yeah. the sleek the will come out, did they get the chance to see how they start shooting at the guys yeah. in the background? And it's at a, times it's just raining bodies. It's just such a great sort of, you know, summarization, sum, summarization of the stakes of, you know, of everything that's at stake, like, you know, for Abe and, and all of his followers. Um, but as as we say goodbye, I, I just really wanted to thank you, Lauren and Benny, for for joining us in this episode of PlayStation Underground and uh, a fresh look at you know Oddworld Soulstorm. Um, so yeah, folks don't have long to wait. It's going to be out on PS4 and PS5 on April 6th. Um, and if you are uh, have an active PlayStation Plus membership, you can get the PS5 version of Oddworld Soulstorm as part of your monthly games benefits, and that's from April 6th to May 3rd. Um, that's not applicable to the PS4 version, just as a note. But yeah. That's Outworld Soulstorm. So thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank Tim, you so Chris, much. thanks so much for having us on. It's been great.